So let's go ahead and invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit as we begin the second half of lesson two. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come Holy Spirit and fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle within us the fire of thy love. O oh, Father, please send forth your Spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O oh, God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant by that same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in your consolation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Once again, St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we left off with proof four in this particular seminar, which was the second way of Aquinas for coming to the knowledge of God's existence. That second way being the argument from causality or the proof of the uncaused cause. The first way of Aquinas was the proof of the unmoved moved mover, argument for motion or change, arriving at this first primary mover which is pure actuality which cannot be moved itself i.e. God. Now for the fifth proof of our seminar which is the third way of Aquinas hopefully you can keep that straight here and, and that is the proof of the necessary being or the argument from possibility and necessity. And there are three basic steps to this proof. First step is as always to defining our terms. What do we mean by a necessary being? And contrast that with a possible being. What do we mean by that? Well, a possible being is a being or beings that do not have to be. Their being, their existence in other words, is not a necessity. In other words, their non-being is a real possibility. So philosophers refer to them as possible beings. Once again, it's possible for them not to be. It's not necessary that they exist for other things to exist, right? Um, their non-being is a real possibility. So for example, we see, we experience, our common experience is that some things go out of being. They go out of existence. So you have a star, right? Uh, do stars, right? Our stars, the sun. Do stars, do scientists tell us that stars, do they go out of existence? Yes. Okay, they can eventually go into non-being. What about a tree? Can a tree, is it possible for a tree not to exist? Yes. Is its non, is its non-being possible? Yes. So these are possible beings, possible realities. Alright? Now, Things that are possible beings, if it's possible for things not to be, if it's possible for those things to go into non-being, well then as Aquinas asserts, then it's possible that they came from non-being. If anything can go into non-being, well then it could have come from non-being. In other words, there was a time when it was not. Okay? So if something is not necessary for existence itself, if it's a possible being, that means it can go into non-being. It's non-being, it's non-existence is a real possibility. Well, if it can go into non-being, well then it must have, if, at some time, come from non-being. Before it's, ex there was a time when it did not exist. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is sort of the first uh, principle here. Now, contrast a possible being to a necessary being. What is a necessary being? Well, we call this God, but we're defining our terms here. A necessary being would be that which has to exist and can never not exist. It never has the potentiality to go into non-being. You remember the star in the tree? It's potential for those things to go into non-being. Thus, it's possible. It's not necessary. But a necessary reality, a necessary being, does not have the, pot the potentiality to go into non-existence. 
So it always has to be. To state it differently, its non-being is not possible. Double negative there, if you can follow that one. Its non-being is not possible. The necessary being is that which must be. It must necessarily exist. So that's what we mean by a necessary being. That's what we mean by God. Okay? So, how can we demonstrate that such a being exists? Well, this leads us to step two. And in step two, what we have to do is that we have to show that the hypothesis that states everything in all reality consists of possible beings. We have to show that that hypothesis is false. We have to show that that statement is actually a contradiction and cannot be true. What is the hypothesis? Everything in reality consists of possible beings. What is a possible being? Something that has the potential to go into non-existence. And if it has the potential to go into non-existence, well then there was a time when it didn't have existence. Okay? It's not necessary. So how do we do this? Well, if everything in existence is possible not to be, well then, there would have been a quote-unquote time, I'm using that term loosely there, because without time, without space and matter and the universe, you don't have time, right? But if everything in existence is possible not to be, well then, there would have been a time, quote-unquote, of non-being for everything, right? If we're going to possible, if we're going to posit and assert that the totality of reality is nothing but possible beings, well that, then, then that means the totality of reality has the potentiality you like that rhyme, huh, Robert? <laughs> I didn't make that one up. <laughs> if the totality of all reality has the potentiality to go into non-existence, well then the totality of reality was at one time non-existent. In non-being. When there was nothing, right? Now remember... The atheistic worldview denies the existence of a necessary being. And so therefore has to logically conclude that all that exists are possible beings, right? But we've just stated that if all that exists are possible beings, well then there would have been a time when absolutely nothing would have existed. There would have been absolute non-being. And as we've already seen before, can you get something from absolute non-being? No. Why? Remember, you can't have the movement from potentiality to actuality without something that's in a state of actuality. Now, as we look on the diagram here, before the totality of reality of possible beings came into existence, it was potentially existing, right? And if, if there is no God, if there is no necessary being, well then, can this totality of reality of possible beings come into existence from absolute potentiality? No, because it can't move itself. To look at the argument from causality, can it cause itself to exist? No, because you can't give what you don't have. Remember last week, pull out the wallet, try to give you a hundred dollar bill, no go. Why? Because I ain't got a hundred dollar bill. I ain't even got a five dollar bill. Because right? I'm a broke man. But we see that if we assert that all that exists are possible beings, no God, no necessary being, well then you're going to have to logically conclude that there was a time, quote unquote, of absolute nothingness, absolute potentiality. And if that were the case, would there be anything now? No. And so therefore we see that it is absurd to say it is false, it is contrary to reason to say that everything in all reality consists of possible beings. And so what's the conclusion? I thought I had it here on the power. Oh yeah, here we go, step three. We make our conclusion for a necessary being. And what's the conclusion? Well, there must be a necessary being. 
We cannot say that the totality of reality consists of possible beings, so therefore there must be at least one necessary being. That which must exist. That which its non-existence is not possible. It doesn't have the potentiality to go into non-existence. It must necessarily exist in order to explain the fact that other things exist. And there we converge back on proof or the second way of St. Thomas Aquinas. And that is this necessary being is pure existence. Absolutely simple. It converges back on that first way of St. Thomas Aquinas. It is pure actuality. It has no potentiality. You see? And that necessary being, which is necessary for everything else that exists, without which there would be nothing in existence, that being we call God. Okay? Now, proof six for this particular seminar, which is the fourth way of Aquinas. And that is the proof of the greatest being, or the argument from degrees of perfection. And let's see how we can do on this one. It's fairly simple. Four steps. First step. Start with our common experience of varying degrees. Right? I think this is pretty common sense. Uh, we notice things around us that in things, or certain things vary in degrees. So, for example, if we look at the diamond that we looked at earlier, you can have a, a diamond that's shiny than others, right? One diamond might not be as shiny or bright as another. There are varying degrees, okay? That's a common experience. If we have a baked pie, right? You might have a baked pie that's hotter in its state coming right out of the oven than it will be an hour later. So notice that we have these degrees of hotness. The pie is more or less hot. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, once we assert uh, degrees of something, once we use these, a term, these terms and arrange things in the terms of more or less, we logically, naturally imply that this thing falls on a scale of most or less, right? Greatest or the least. So the minute we posit the idea that something is more or less, we automatically imply a scale of greatest and least in regard to whatever perfection we're looking at. Whether it be hotness or whether it be light or brightness. You know, if you think of color, right? Uh, a lighter color approaches uh, the extreme of pure white. Or a darker color approaches the extreme of pure blackness. You see? So the idea is that our experience of degrees of perfection, more or less, naturally imply a scale of extremes, of the greatest and the least. So if we have something that is more or less hot, that degree of hotness will be determined by its distance from the source of heat. You see? Okay, so that's our first step. We start with this common experience of degrees of perfection in ordinary circumstances of life. Now we can also apply degrees of perfection to being itself. Right? So for example... And this is step two, by the way, applying degrees of perfection to being. For example, it is better to have being than non-being, right? So being is higher in degree of perfection than non-being, nothingness, okay? Being is better than nothingness. Now, as we go up on the scale, we see that an intelligent being is greater in perfection than a non-intelligent being, contrary to what some people say out there, right? Uh, an intelligent being, a human, is greater in the scale or on the scale of being than a rock, which is non-intelligent, right? Okay, or even an animal. Even though it has sensory knowledge, it does not have intellectual abstract knowledge. And so the intelligent being who knows and who loves is higher on the scale of being than a non-intelligent being. So we see that as we go on the scale, as we say something is more perfect than other things, more good than other things, we imply the scale of approaching greatness or the greatness 
greatest in being, you might say, right? So, this leads us to step three. And that is to prove that the series of caused causes of the perfections cannot go or regress infinite in an infinite series. So we look at our, our chart here, right? Because perfections exist in beings themselves, and if that being is a, is a caused being, right? Well then, that being that has the perfection must receive its perfection from a higher being with higher perfections. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's start with some reality which is simply limited in degrees of perfection. Well that reality, as you see on the chart, uh, must be caused by a something else, right? That's higher in being and has a higher degree of perfection. Now, can that bottom reality there on the chart, can that reality with a restricted degree of perfection, can it exist without its cause that's higher in the degrees of perfection? No. Well then, can, can that, so let's call that CC1, cause, cause 1. Can that cause of a higher degree of perfection, can it exist without another cause causing it with a higher degree of perfection? No. Can that CC1 exist without the higher being of perfection, CC2? No. Can CC2 exist without CC3? Can CC3 exist without CC4? No. So even in this argument, we see that you cannot regress infinitely in the degrees of perfection because you have to constantly look to one above it for a higher degree of perfection in order to explain the existence of the degrees of perfection in the reality that we're looking at, right? And because an infinite series is always one more that can never be achieved, right? It just keeps going on and on and on and on. So no matter where we're at in the series, can we ever come to a degree of perfection? No. Would degrees of perfection even exist? No. Because the higher being with higher perfection is never going to exist because it relies on something else beyond it, which can never exist because it's going to rely on something else beyond it, and that goes in infinitely, then you have no perfection whatsoever. Right? So in this step three, we prove that you cannot regress infinitely in the series of calls causes of perfection. You see? And so therefore in step four we make the application of an absolutely perfect being. Because we cannot regress infinitely of, the, of causes of perfection, we must come to that uncaused cause, right? But that uncaused cause is the greatest in perfection. It's the greatest of all degrees of perfection. So it's absolutely perfect. It's absolutely good. From which all perfections, goodness, come. And so St. Thomas Aquinas concludes that this absolutely perfect being, which lacks nothing, which lacks no perfection, because then it would have potentiality, right? And so therefore converging on the other arguments. This absolute reality, this greatest being that is absolutely perfect is what we call God. And so therefore we say God is perfect. Because it is from His being itself that all goodness, all perfection comes. And everything that we perceive to be perfect or everything that we perceive to be good is measured against the greatest degree of perfection, which is God. Okay? Now, we move to proof 7 for our seminar, which is the fifth way of St. Thomas Aquinas. And that is from the, the argument from final causality, also known as teleology. Teleology comes from the Greek word telos, which means in goal, right? An in goal, something you're directed toward, all right? So let's, three steps for this proof. First step, let's talk about our common experience of final causality. What do we mean by this? Well, in our experience, 
what do we find? We find cause and effect patterns, right? We find certain things that have a sort of embedded goal directedness. There are goal oriented systems. Whenever we're talking about cause and effect, whatever is an efficient cause of something, it's always pointed to or directed toward a certain effect, right? And that effect that the cause is oriented to, that effect is what we call the final cause, according to Aristotle. It's final causality. Okay, so for example, let's take a match, right? When you strike a match, it generally, under normal circumstances, generates what? Flame and heat, right? Notice it doesn't generate, it never generates frost and cold. <laughs> it never generates the smell of lilacs or, th or the sound of thunder. In ordinary circumstances, the striking of a match is ordered toward, directed to, goal-oriented to flame and heat. That effect of flame and heat is the final causality, the final cause, the end goal of the match itself. Does that make sense? Okay. So all we're doing right here is trying to establish an understanding or an awareness of final causality. Take an acorn, for example. What will the acorn, what is the end goal of the acorn? What is the acorn order toward by its very nature? To become an oak tree, right? And then once again, here we get into potentiality and actuality, right? But the point is, is that it's ordered toward, it has an end goal of an oak tree. That's the final cause. So that's what we understand by final causality. Goal-oriented systems. Goal-directedness embedded in the very nature of things. Now we move to step two. Final causality demands intelligence. Why so? Okay, well, the effect or the end goal of something, right, cannot be achieved unless it in some way already exists. But if it can't exist in reality, I'm starting with the theory here, then we'll flesh it out with the examples, alright? The goal or the effect cannot be achieved unless it in some way exists. But it, it doesn't exist in reality yet because it hasn't occurred. So where's the only other place that it can exist in order for that thing to be oriented toward the effect? It must exist in an intellect. It must exist in an intelligence. So, for example, let's look at the house and the construction worker, right? The end goal of the act of constructing a house is a house. That's the final cause for the house builder. But that final cause, the house, can, could not be achieved unless it did not first exist, where? In the mind. The house doesn't exist in reality yet, obviously, it has to be built, but it has to in some way exist, at least as an idea, in the mind, in order for the builder to direct his work toward the final cause of a house. Okay? So we see this principle that final causality demands intelligence. An effect or the goal of a goal-oriented system cannot be achieved unless it first exists somewhere, at least as an idea in an intellect. So like for example the acorn. The end goal of the acorn is the oak tree. Well the oak tree could not be achieved, the acorn could not be directed toward the final cause of the oak tree unless the oak tree in some way existed. But it doesn't exist in reality yet so it at least has to exist as an idea in a mind, in an intellect. Which would order and orient the acorn and direct it toward the end goal. Take, for example, the match. The final cause of the match was flame and heat. Well, in order for the match to be ordered toward that end, that end must exist in some way. If it doesn't exist in reality yet, it must exist at least as an idea in an intellect that orders the match toward the final cause. So therefore, anything that is inherently directed toward an end by its nature must be directed towards that end by an 
intellect. And that end must exist as an idea in that intellect. This is the fundamental basis for this particular proof for God's existence. Which leads us to step three. And that is making the application for a supreme and infinite intelligence. Thus this unmoved mover, unconditioned reality, uncaused cause, perfect being, right? Necessary being would be the supreme, infinite, unrestricted intelligence. Thus a personal God. And so God is not the force be with you. But God would be personal because only persons have intelligence. So how do we reason to the supreme infinite intelligence? Well, take all of reality. If we look at the principle of goal-oriented systems to final causes, well, the totality of reality consists of goal-oriented systems to final causes, right? And all of those goal-oriented systems to final causes must be directed by an intellect. And all of the final causes must exist as an idea in an intellect. And so the intellect, there must be an intellect that directs every single goal-oriented system in, ex in existence to its final causes. At the same time, that intellect would have to hold all of the goal-oriented systems in existence together, know them all, and direct them all this is through this power, this acting power, and direct them all at the same time to their final causes. And all of those final causes of everything, of every goal-oriented system in the totality of reality, those final causes would have to exist at the same time in the intellect that we're talking about here. My dear friends, such an intellect would have to be supreme indeed. An intellect that would have to hold all of these things at the same time in its mind. An intellect that would have to direct all of the goal-oriented systems in the totality of reality to their final causes, causes all at the same time. That requires infinite power. And further, this supreme intellect that we're looking at would have to be the cause of all of those goal-oriented systems. Why? Because if the intellect, if the supreme intellect, is directing all of the goal-oriented systems to their final causes, well then, that supreme intellect is causing them to exist. Because to direct the goal-oriented systems to their final causes is to cause that movement. And to cause that movement, it must be the cause of those things. So we see that the supreme intellect must be the uncaused cause. The unconditioned reality that grounds the existence of all of these things in reality that are oriented to final causes. And this supreme intelligence, that's a pure act of intellection, a pure act of mental activity, right? If it's pure acting power, it's pure intelligence. This pure acting intelligence is what we call God, okay? Now, we come to the second major component of tonight's reflection, and that is a summary of the attributes of God. So, in light of the, let's see, what proof was that? Proof seven. In light of seven proofs so far, we can summarize all of the various attributes that we can come to know by reason about God. So, for example, God is pure being, right? How do we know? Well, remember, we saw that God is free from any boundaries. When we looked at absolute simplicity. Because God is free from any boundaries, He cannot exclude anything else, right? God is free from all boundaries, therefore He's compatible to everything else that exists. He's totally inclusive to every boundary stricken reality. Thus, He's pure simplicity. And if He's pure simplicity compatible to every other existing being, He's pure being. You see? Unrestricted act of being. Next attribute. God is infinite. Well, if God, how do we know this? Well, remember, God is boundaryless. So he's not restricted to any finite way of existing because to be restricted to a particular way of existing means finitude, means you're finite. 
And so if God is not restricted to any particular way of existing, if he is unrestricted act of being, if he is boundaryless, both extrinsic and intrinsic within himself, well then he is infinite. Boundaryless. Not restricted by any particular mode of existence. God is one, our next attribute. How do we know this? Well, remember the minute we try to postulate another uncaused cause or an unmoved mover and an unconditioned reality, we're going to have to differentiate one from the other. And the minute we do that, we restrict it. And therefore, it's not absolutely simple anymore. It's not, it can't be the uncaused cause. It can't be the unmoved mover. It can't be the unconditioned reality. You see? So there has to be absolutely one unconditioned reality, one uncaused cause, one unmoved mover, one necessary being. You see? What was the next one? <laughs> one greatest perfect reality, one pure acting power, that's God. All of these things converge and are one in the same in the very essence of God. God is spiritual and immaterial. We can show this in two ways. Remember, we said God is pure act, right? Does God have any potentiality in him? No, he's pure acting power, right? There's nothing of potentiality in God. Well, guess what? Remember, Anything that has potentiality and that can move from potentiality to actuality, that movement from potentiality to actuality occurs in the material world. Everything that's material, remember we said that? Everything in the material world has potentiality to not exist, right? Okay? So potentiality only belongs to the material world. Change, right? Remember we said change? What is change? The movement from potentiality to actuality. Change belongs to the material world. Can God change? No. Why? Because he's pure act. He has no potentiality, right? So he can't change. He's changed less. And if he can't change, can he be material? No. Because change is necessarily bound to the material world. Second way that we know God is immaterial or spiritual is we said that God can never go out of being, right? Once again, God does not have the potentiality to go out of being. Well, the idea of going out of being belongs to things of the material world. We saw that with the tree and the sun. Things of the material world have the potentiality to go out of being. Well, if God can't go out of being, if he's the necessary being, well then can God be material? No. He must be immaterial. He must be purely spiritual. God is eternal. We saw this in two ways in our various proofs. We said that God was the timeless creator of finite past time, right? Well, if he's the timeless creator, then he's outside of time. And if he's outside of time, well, then he is eternal. Secondly, we said that he's the unchanged changer. God cannot move from potentiality to actuality. Because he has no potentiality. He's pure acting power, right? So because he cannot move or change, he's outside of time. Why? Because what is time? The measurement of change. Time is the measurement of the movement from potentiality to actuality, right? So if God can't do that stuff, if God can't move from potentiality to actuality, well then he's outside of time. You see? He is eternal. Uh, next, God is transcendent, but yet at the same time, imminent. How do we know he's transcendent? Well, he's pure simplicity, right? He is the highest being on the chain of being, so to speak. He even goes beyond that because he is compatible with every state of being and every possible state of being. And so consequently, he transcends all forms of existence. Remember, can God, can God be restricted to the existence of the proton? No. Can God be restricted to the existence of the electron? No. Can God be restricted to the existence of the tree? No. Therefore, we don't go and hug the tree and sing Kumbaya and worship the tree, right? Amen? This is why we're not pantheists. We don't, God is transcendent to every created reality, every boundary stricken reality. He is transcendent because he's absolutely simple. He's not bound to that particular way of existence. So he's transcendent. But yet, at the same time, he is imminent. Is he present to that tree out there? Yes. Why? Because he's grounding it in existence right here and right now. He is the unconditioned reality that grounds the existence of everything else in existence. 
And so he is so imminent that he is, he is so close to everything because he is present to it, holding it in existence. Even the souls in hell. You know, some people often talk about, is God in hell? And there's a partial truth to that. In the sense, hear me closely, in the sense that God holds that person in existence. Even that person who is definitively separated from God's love and the experience of God and the beatific vision, right? God nevertheless holds that soul in existence because He is the ground of existence. So we see this attribute of God that He is imminent, but yet at the same time, transcendent. So in catechism class, in the, in the good old days, when we learned that God was transcendent and imminent, now we know why. We move on. We know God is intelligent. How do we know that? Well, remember uh, the fifth way of Aquinas, St. Thomas. We, through St. Thomas's reasoning, we concluded of the supreme infinite intelligence, right? That supreme infinite intellect is the pure, pure acting power, the uncaused cause. So God is intelligent. God is omnipotent and omniscient, right? He's omnipotent because he cannot be restricted in his acting power. Because he's pure being, absolutely simple, he can't be restricted in his act of power. So therefore, he is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Anything that's restricted in power is finite. Because God is unrestricted in power, he's infinite and thus omnipotent, all-powerful. But he's also omniscient too, right? Precisely because he, as the absolutely simple, unconditioned reality, holds everything in existence and directs those things to their final causes, so therefore he must know these things. He must know the final causes to direct those things to their final causes. And then finally, God is good. Why? Because he's pure being. What is goodness? What is good? Something is good if it succeeds in being the kind of thing it's meant to be. Something is good if it succeeds in being the kind of thing it's meant to be. Something is bad when it fails in being the kind of thing it's meant to be. Well, God is pure being, right? We showed, we showed, we showed that already. If He's pure being, is there any lack of being in Him? No. Is there any failure in being what He's meant to be? No, because he's infinite, there's no finitude, there's no restriction, there's no potentiality, and on and on and on. So therefore, he's absolutely good, because he's pure being itself. Okay? All right. So, Larry, go ahead. If I was to argue that point with my atheist friends, right. how would I do that? I mean, they're going to say, what about the bad? What about the and we're going to get to that in component number four. If we get there, oh man, I only got a few minutes. In component number four, we get to the problem of evil, and hopefully I'll give you some sufficient answers to be able to answer the problem of evil, okay? And the fact that God can still exist even in the face of evil. Okay, so let's briefly look at the impossibility of disproving God. Uh, this comes from Father Robert Spitzer's book, New Proofs for God's Existence. And he basically gives three reasons why we cannot disprove God. And the way he explicates this is by saying that there are three ways to disprove something. Number one, the falsity affirmed by rigorous public corroboration. That is, you can show something to be false if it can be publicly corroborated, publicly verified. Secondly, if you can show something to be an intrinsic contradiction. And thirdly, if that something contradicts other facts. Okay? So Father Robert Spitzer goes on to show that the first reason... Why we know you can't disprove God? Because the non-existence of God cannot be affirmed by public corroboration. The non-existence of God cannot be affirmed by public verification. Okay? For example, if I wanted to prove the existence of something, that's pretty simple. Like say I wanted to prove the existence of a dog, right? Well then all I have to do to prove the existence of a dog is to experience a dog one time. 
and then have public corroboration to verify that experience, right? But if I want to prove the non-existence of something, such as an alien or aliens, right? Well, then it becomes extremely, almost impossible to do so by public verification. And there are three ways. If I want to prove the non-existence of aliens, if I want to prove it absolutely, there are three things I'm going to have to do. Number one, now, am I saying aliens exist? No, I'm just saying you can't disprove their existence, okay? By public corroboration. Why? Because the first thing I would have to do, I would have to experience everything that there is to experience. Then, secondly, I would have to be absolutely certain that I've exhausted all possible ways of, of experience. I would have to be as certain that I had exhausted the entire range of possible experiences. You see? So I'd have to experience everything that there is to exist, and I'd have to know there's nothing else to experience. And then I would have to conclude and notice aliens don't exist. And then have that non-existence of aliens publicly verified by everybody else. You see? Now that's a daunting task. Is it really possible that I can experience everything that there is to experience? Is it really possible that I can be absolutely certain that there's nothing else to experience and I've exhausted all possible experiences? No, that's a pretty daunting task. Just in regard to the non-existence of aliens. Now, do they exist? I don't know, probably not. That's my own personal opinion. But what I'm saying is that we cannot disprove their existence through public corruption collaboration and experience, you see? And then when we come to God, it's even harder. It's even more daunting. Not only can you not experience everything that there is to experience and be certain that there's nothing else to experience about God, but God is beyond our experience. Because God is immaterial, right? God is infinite. He's not restricted. He's not confined to our sensation and our experiences in this life. He transcends that. So literally, we can't experience God like we would experience aliens in the universe, so to speak. Because He's beyond that sensation and experience. The only way one can experience God is if God allows for himself, for an individual to experience him through mystical revelation or some, some sort of intimate uh, union like that, through grace, right? But looking from this natural perspective of public corroboration, we can't disprove God's existence. No more than we can disprove the existence of aliens. Okay, secondly, the concept of God cannot be an intrinsic contradiction. Remember we said if we want to disprove something, we've got to show it's an intrinsic contradiction, right? Such as up is down. That violates the principle of non-contradiction. Why? Because up has certain boundaries, down has certain boundaries, and you can't have two. You can't have a square circle, right? That violates the principle of non-contradiction. That's an intrinsic contradiction. Why? Because square has boundaries, square... Uh, <laughs> circle. <laughs> I said squirrel. <laughs> Circle has boundaries. And so because they have a, um, particular boundaries, they exclude one another, right? Okay, now... So the only way to improve, to prove something to be an intrinsic contradiction is if it has boundaries, right? If it excludes, well, does God have boundaries? No, nope. he's boundaryless. And so as Father Robert Spitzer concludes, you can, God cannot be an intrinsic contradiction. So therefore, you can't disprove God by that methodology. And then finally, the third reason why you can't disprove God is because the concept of God cannot contradict any facts. There is nothing of the finite world, there is nothing of finitude that can contradict God. Why? Because God cannot exclude anything else in existence. Because he is boundaryless. He is all-inclusive of all possible modes of existence. And so there is no finite fact that can disprove God. So as Father Robert Spitzer states, um, for example, if protons exist, well then God can exist. Well, you can't say that because protons are finite, they're finitude, God is boundaryless, and he can't exclude those protons, otherwise they couldn't exist, right? Or you can't say, because electromagnetic fields exist, God can't exist. So there is nothing of the finite world that can disprove God. Because God is boundaryless. Pure simplicity. 
So, uh, these are the reasons why uh, Father Robert Spitzer gives that we cannot disprove God. It is reasonably impossible. Now we come to the problem of evil, right? How can an all good and loving God exist when evil exists in the world? The first answer I would like to share with you is very briefly, such a statement implies the existence of an absolute standard of goodness. The very moment you acknowledge something to be wrong or evil, you logically necessarily imply an objective absolute standard of goodness, which we identify to be God, right? So I find it interesting that people will use evil to disprove God when evil actually points in the direction to God. Because the minute I say something is evil, I'm saying something is what it ought not to be. Well, that ought not to be implies that there is a standard of being of goodness. You see? That everything else must conform to. So I find it interesting that in the very acknowledgement of evil, you necessarily logically imply some sort of objective, absolute standard of goodness, which we identify in God. Secondly, a proper understanding of evil shows how God can indeed exist even in the face of evil, even when faced with evil. And our first principle is this. Evil is a privation of being. Okay? Remember, recall what I just said. When we observe evil, we say something is what it ought not to be. Something that is bad is a lack of goodness. And so as St. Augustine and all of the saints in the past have seen that evil is not an essence in and of itself. Evil is only the lack of essence. Evil or badness, the concept of badness, can only be understood against the backdrop of the good. And so badness or evil is simply the lack of goodness. To state it differently, it's the lack of being, right? So, for example, let's take uh, the horrendous example of, um, you know, of pedophilia, right? I mean, some people will say, how can God exist when you have these priests or men or whatever, uh, adults molesting children, right? How can God exist when such a moral evil like this exists? Even in your own church, Carlo, right? Well, that moral evil, friends, reveals that there is a lack of moral goodness, right? So that evil cannot be seen as an essence in and of itself, but it is simply a, a lack of good. It is an abuse of free will, right? You see, the abuse part can only be understood when you understand the goodness of free will, of how it ought to be used. Or so, for example, let's take just an apple, right? What makes a bad apple? It lacks the goodness of what it's meant to be an apple. It's a rotten apple, right? The bad apple, the rotten apple, can only be seen or understood against the backdrop of a good apple, of what it's supposed to be. So evil is a privation of being. It's a privation of goodness. What is God? Absolute being. Absolute goodness. There is no lack thereof. And so therefore, any evil that we experience in this life cannot come from God because it is a lack of goodness. God is pure goodness. So whether it be moral evil or even physical evil, it's a lack of being and consequently does not come from God. So God as pure being can still exist even though there is lack of goodness that we experience in the world. Now, the second principle to understand is the origin of evil. Where does evil come from? Whence does evil come? Well, let's look at moral evil first. As we just stated, moral evil comes from the free will, right? Now, that free will is a good power given to us by the Creator, that supreme intelligent power who is all-powerful, thus having an infinite will as well. The free will comes from that Creator, so it's good in and of itself. But what is moral evil? It's the abuse of that good. It is the failure to use the free will according to its purpose. 
And so we see that the origin of evil does not come from God, but the origin of moral evil comes from the abuse of the free will. So consequently, God can still exist even in the presence of moral evil. Now what about physical evil? You know, what about the, 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 the horrific storm of Sandy that takes place, right? What is the origin of physical evils that harm humanity? Well, that's a very good question. And in order to answer that question, we have to indeed appeal to Christian revelation. Because we actually find, according to Christian revelation, as revealed in this creation story, that the origin of physical evil that harms humanity comes from moral evil. That is the first abuse of free will of the human race. Disordering, as Christian Revelation teaches us, disordering the whole of creation itself. Whereas things of the physical world would actually harm humanity. And humanity would suffer physical evils and the lack of perfection of physical material things. You see? So moral evil comes from the abuse of free will. Physical evil itself actually comes from the abuse of free will at the beginning and the dawn of human existence. Consequently, we find the answer to the question of the origin of evil. It does not come from God. It comes from the abuse of free will. Ultimately. Now, fundamentally, the question is, okay, now I understand the origin of evil comes from the abuse of free will, but how can, why does the all-powerful and good God permit the evil to exist, right? How can the evil still exist when this all-powerful and all-good God exists? So this leads us to answer three to the problem of evil. And that is, in regard to moral evil, God respects human freedom, folks. He allows and permits moral evil to exist precisely because He intends for love to exist. By God creating creatures with free will and the ability to accept Him, therein lies the possibility to reject him and thus the possibility of moral evil and God is not going to snap someone out of existence when they reject him God's not going to create a creature with free will with the ability to reject him and then snap him out of existence because he did I say accept or reject let me restate that. God is not going to create a creature with free will with the ability to accept him and then snap him out of existence when, he, when the creature rejects him. That would be contrary to his wisdom. He creates creatures with free will to love him which involves the possibility to hate him. And even though when those creatures hate him or reject him, he still holds them in existence. Because once he creates... He stays committed to that creation. So moral evil continues to exist because God continues to respect human freedom. Now, this leads us to answer four. In regard to both physical and moral evil, and this is the fundamental answer to the problem of evil, in regard to both physical and moral evil, God allows and permits such evils to exist because He can bring about such a greater good that allows, that the allowance of evil is justifiable. So fundamentally, because he can bring about a greater good. And this is what the Catechism states in paragraph 311. Quote, He permits it, however, that is evil. He permits evil, however, because he respects the freedom of his creatures and, mysteriously, knows how to derive good from it. So there we have a summary of what I just stated. God permits moral evil because he respects human freedom. And then secondly, he permits both moral and physical evil because he can bring about a greater good mysteriously. Now the rationale behind that is that God is infinite in power. Because he is omnipotent and infinite in power and sufferings of this life are finite, well then it's perfectly reasonable to conclude that there is no limit to the good that God can bring out of such evil experiences. Because he's infinite. So God is not limited in his power of goodness. Amen? And so consequently, there is no limit to the good that he can bring out of 
such evil experiences. There is no limit to the good that can outweigh the existence of such evil experiences. So what are some examples of this great good? Well, because we have immortal souls, which is a whole other talk, we can have increase in character and the quality of soul, even through suffering. And this is seen just on a reasonable, natural level, that through suffering, you increase in character of soul, uh, the character of the soul. You increase in integrity, etc. And then ultimately, from Christian revelation, beatific vision with God, right? Through the revelation of Jesus Christ, we know that the ultimate good that outweighs any evil that we can possibly experience in this life, even Auschwitz, right? Or any possible evil as such, the beatific vision and the glory to come outweighs any evil that we experience in this life. So God being infinite in power can bring about a greater good. And this is precisely why we can say that evil is permitted to exist. My dear friends, if we say there is no God, well then we're stuck with the evil that we experience and there is no answer. There is no justification for such permission of evil. So I like to look at evil even in its most horrific ways and actually see how such the existence of such evil actually demands the existence of a just God who can bring about a greater good to make right what has been wrong. It necessarily requires that. And then finally we come to answer five. And as one Thomistic philosopher says, the argument from evil is worthless. Why? Because it commits the fallacy of circular reasoning. An atheist will say, no God exists because of suffering. Basically, right? Just to get to the essence of the argument. God does not exist because of suffering. But notice the presupposition of that statement. The presupposition of that statement is that suffering is unjustifiable. So they say, God doesn't exist because of suffering. But that presupposes that they believe that suffering is unjustifiable, right? So if I ask them, why doesn't God exist? They answer, because of suffering. Well, why is suffering unjustifiable? Because there is no God. You see? They actually assume in the argument, God does not exist because of suffering. They're actually assuming what they're trying to prove. They're trying to prove that God doesn't exist, but before they even try to prove that, they're assuming God doesn't exist. And in philosophy, we call that circular reasoning. It's a fallacy. It cannot be true. So as you see there on the PowerPoint, in the circular reasoning fashion, they say no God because of suffering, but suffering is bad and unjustifiable because there is no God. You see? So they are assuming what they're trying to prove. Thus, it is a fallacious argument. Consequently, the existence of evil, or the experience of evil, I should say, because evil does not have existence in and of itself, because it's not an essence, but only the lack of essence, right? Our experience of evil does not negate or disprove the existence of God. And so therefore we have, my friends, we conclude with lesson two of our case for God's existence where we have gone through proofs three through seven in this seminar which constituted the five waves of St. Thomas Aquinas as well as looking at how uh, we cannot disprove God, looking at the summary of the attributes of God and then also answering the problem of evil. So hopefully, my dear friends, there is something in these two hours that you can take with you. And remember, even if it's just the cat, right, Lee? Hey, even if it's the cat, or even if it's just the light, right? And once you have that starting point, I am confident that in regard to what we've learned so far, you will be able to reason yourself to the existence of God and hopefully help others to do the same. Let's close with prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, St. John tells us in John chapter 1 verse 1 that you are the Logos. You are the Word of God. You are pure reason itself. We ask that our intellects may be always stimulated by your grace so that we can come to know you and live out the Imago Dei. We are made in the image of reason and love. And so may we use our reason and use our will to love in order that we may live out 
the image that we're called to conform to. And so as we continue our study, dear Lord, in regard to your existence, the existence of Almighty God, may we come to know you more, which will hopefully lead to love you more and ultimately to serve you in worship of you and the beatific vision and the heavenly liturgy and the afterlife. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.